I was a, a cancer researcher at, at Yale University for over 10 years. And in 2001, I accepted a position at University of New Haven. And uh, I, right after, a year later, I ended up having Lyme disease. This whole experience uh, practically made me think whether, whether should, I, should I continue my cancer research or should I start to do a completely different research. I think that my cancer research background has really helped me to, to ask different questions in this infectious disease project. My first question was, what happens to Lyme bacteria when you treat it with antibiotics or any other, other agent, whether, whether, whether when they turn to cyst form or biofilm form or any other form. Obviously, when I, when I was investigating it, I was, I was looking at papers, uh, literature, what kind of different bacteria, protozoa, parasite, virus can be found in a ticks. And, and I was actually surprised that uh, it was some research in Connecticut that wasn't as comprehensive I, I, I thought it should have been. So let's just go out, let's just collect some ticks and let's just see what other co-infections can be found in, in ticks. And that led to discoveries like the mycoplasma, mycoplasma discovery and the very recent discovery with filarial nematodes, which is actually both uh, uh, co-infections being published as we speak. And don't forget the brain. Brain, uh, brain is, is a, an organ which is very juicy. So actually it is, it is a perfect food for Borrelia. I know it sounds, sounds very strange, but brain, brain is something I should, we should definitely look at. And if you look at Dr. Dr. Uh, McDonald's research or Dr. M Judith Miklosi research, they find spiral heat uh, with, with immunohistochemistry, they find spiral heat right in the brain, especially on those plugs, which is very characteristic, for example, for Alzheimer patients. Everywhere, everywhere. Uh, again, from, from this phone conversation, I know that practically almost every joint in the body can be, can be a target for Borrelia. And again, if you think about biofilm, which, is, which we're going to talk probably later, being a slimy layer, layer you, need, you need some kind of surface. And I think joints being, being the, the structure of it and even the, just the anatomy, it would be a perfect uh, space for Borrelia to grow on as a in biofilm. I mean, from all research I can talk about Borrelia, Borrelia has at least six to seven different uh, forms to able to hide. Obviously, the spiral heat form, which is, which is the one which is practically the most uh, susceptible for any kind of treatment. But you all also have uh, the, the cystic forms. And also you have the biofilm forms, you have the granular forms, and you have at least five to six different pleomorphic forms which can reside in the cells. Okay, so we, we talk about spiral heat as a, spi as a spiral heat forms, which is the coarse screw strip. You have the biofilm forms, which I think is, is probably more than just one form. So we are already studying different conditions, how the biofilm, uh, biofilm forms, and we already find that different environment creates different biofilms. So, depends on how many forms you can count, maybe some soft forms, A, B, C, D. Uh, of course, the granular forms, which we find extremely, extremely uh, uh, resistant to any kind of treatment. And of course, the bio, uh, cyst, oh, I almost forget the cystic form, the famous form, which is the, the famous hiding place for Borrelia. It's like, think about like a little cocoon when it can, can enter and sort of hide until you, you're done with your treatment. And of course, all the pleomorphic forms, which is, which is probably countless. We don't even know how many different forms uh, uh, can, be, can be counted as a pleomorphic form. So when I say six to seven, it is probably 10 to, to 20 or even 30 different forms. It's a very interesting syphilis research uh, from the 1920s, 30s, and it's a very famous uh, drawing about the different forms of syphilis, streptomena. And let's see, it's about uh, 10, I would say at least 60, 70 different forms on these tables. We know that some strains are more pathogenic. The, the strain we're studying, the B31, is one of the monsters. So we need, to, we need to isolate those strains and do some laboratory research to be sure that's what we're seeing is true. Uh, but knowing spiral heat, I think even the B9 strain can really cause lots of problems. So, so 
I hope you're right and I hope you, we can find that only certain strain can cause those chronic diseases and maybe we can find some certain treatment. But, but being a little bit pessimistic here, I'm afraid even the other strain can, can cause some, uh, some significant problem. Yeah, the stiffness is actually is very, very common. Uh, again, I'm not a, not a medical doctor, so I, I cannot really answer this question why the stiffness is, is so important. But I think something about, something about the, the brain having the most, uh, most uh, delicious food for Borrelia. I wonder this part of the body when, when most of the time Borrelia resides. I know it sounds gross, but certain parts of the body is probably just, just better for, for nutrition. If you, if you look at the, nut uh, the nutritional requirement of Borrelia, it is quite significant. I don't know if you are aware of it, that when we, when we culture Borrelia in the lab, we have to use a very rich media. Actually, Bordefer, who discovered Borrelia, uh, designed, one of the one person designed this uh, media, and, and we, we didn't have too much luck to replace this media. So Borrelia has a very significant nutritional requirement. I didn't, I didn't expect that, that one species like Borrelia can make this very complex biofilm formation. And uh, some of the images which you can see on, on, in this wall also shows that, that definitely even one species is able to create the whole, whole, whole city. And can you imagine if, if it's more species can join to this biofilm, obviously it would be way much more complex and probably way much more we much, we much, they can develop very much uh, more different ways to evade your treatment. Uh, in, inside the biofilm, unfortunately, you can find all kinds of forms. Let's say we just talk about that, just, just one kind of biofilm, the Borrelia biofilm. Just for all research, we could see cyst form, granule forms, and probably some pleomorphic forms. So, so, the, so those forms, we know that they have very, uh, very, very much developed the resistance to, the, uh, to, to treatment. Now, on these forms, you even put one more layer of protection, and now you try to, try to uh, treat it with, with antibiotics. First of all, antibiotics might not even able to penetrate. However, we have seen little channels in the biofilm, so maybe those channels enough enough, big enough to, to buy uh, antibodies penetrate. But don't forget, antibodies only works if the, if the bacteria is growing, because that's the whole mechanism. In biofilm, the whole idea is to sort of survival mode. So the bacteria most likely is not growing. Or well, later uh, research shows that microfilia, microfilia uh, nematodes can be found in ticks. Uh, this is, this is, this is, this is a, a worm. Uh, you're going to ask how the worm can fit in ticks. Unfortunately, the larval stage, which is micron side, can be found in the gut, gut tissue. Uh, we have shown that 84% of the ticks carry mycoplasma, one of the species uh, mycoplasma. And right now, we send out the paper a couple of times, but I think because it's such a new, new idea, the reviewer had really hard time to accept it. Right now, we do immuno, immuno study, immunohistochemical studies to show that mycoplasma indeed in the thick guts. And I have one graduate, graduate student, Sima, who is actually finishing up this paper. I think that will be a big one because mycoplasma is something which, which is very difficult to, to kill. I don't know how much you have aware that you know if you have like mycoplasma pneumonia, the treatment is eight to nine months long. So now you talk about you know the tr treatment length, which is a big, of course, a big uh, uh, argument in Lyme disease patient. If those Lyme disease patient has mycoplasma infection, we definitely have to think about a long term, a long term treatment.